I'm deeply honored to be your patron and wish to thank your wonderful CEO, Lakshmi, and all solicitors of the elderly for honoring us and our jubilee by inviting me to give this keynote address with the support of our very special guest of honor, from whom you'll hear later, Barbara Windsor. Thank you for your enthusiasm in so generously promoting our cause and encouraging your members to help us extend our regular act of friendship to many more isolated older people. Before I, ask about how, before I talk about how you can help, you may enjoy some insights from my career as a solicitor, composer, and campaigner. You see, I acquired three sets of genes, artistic from my father's side, commercial from my mother's, and concern for the underprivileged from a remarkable great-grandfather, David Lubelsky, a unique employer who was venerated by industrial historians, who as long ago as 1880 campaigned for the rights of employees, his own employees, and the rights of women. These three genes made it hard to decide what to do when I left Cambridge in 1958. Articles attracted no pay in those days, and rather than see me starve in a garret as a playwright or a composer, my parents <coughs> insisted on paying up front 500 pounds for three years articles with a Leeds firm of solicitors. Although I was reluctant at the start, it turned out to be the best investment they ever made in yours truly. On my first day, my principal introduced me to the staff with, we got our young lad from Cambridge, I want no bloody swearing in this office. <laughs> he then gave me my first task, to draft my own articles from the precedent book, which provided the miraculous escape clause. The master shall allow the pupil to spend the last year of the three-year term at the London agents which I inserted in the deed, which was to change the entire course of my life, as after spending the, my final year of articles with the firm's agents in London, I have stayed here happily ever since. But before we leave Leeds, my principal's client handling is worthy of note. When asked, in fact, it was my first, first meeting with a client. I was eventually allowed up from the coal cellar to attend the first client meeting. <laughs> and uh, the client had a florally decorated hat, and she, after a long consultation, she asked my principal, what's the law on this? And he replied, what's the law? Rather like Mr. Bumble, browbeating Oliver Trist with, do you want some more? You see them, that large bookcase of law, that's law reports. Each book has 40 odd cases in which plaintiffs and defendants each thought they knew the law. So did their solicitors and barristers who presented their case and told the judge their clients were right. After hearing them, the High Court made a decision which was sometimes appealed to the Lord Justices of Appeal, who sometimes couldn't agree on what the law was. Sometimes the decision was appealed to the law lords who couldn't make up their mind either. And sometimes, even if their decision was unanimous, Parliament overruled the House of Lords by Act of Parliament and you're asking me what the bloody law is. <laughs> Music and law. The art artistic gene clicked in while I was studying for my law exams when I began to write for the theatre and to compose music. To combine my musical and legal interests, I switched from commercial law at Freshfields to music law at a copyright law firm to learn, as we all do, at the client's expense. I soon had to consider three tracks of a major pop group client who'd sold 10 million copies of an album, uh, which the widow of a, a famous 20th century classical composer alleged he, he had infringed his copyright. She began by telling us, my husband must be turning in his grave. But a few months later, after we finally settled, playing his estate 
25% of the royalties from this gold mine album. Her message was rather different. Please tell them to do it again. We've earned more from these three pop group traps in six months than my late husband's entirely music catalogue earned since he died 30 years ago. So much for the monetary value of classical music. I campaigned against apartheid and I wrote a play called The Deal about South Africa which performed at the Edinburgh Festival in 1969. But I had to leave South Africa in rather a hurry for asking too many questions. As you'll see from the clip, I also asked a lot of questions as a composer and music publisher member of the Performing Rights Society during my long and successful campaign to make it accountable to its members in the 70s. I asked why PRS, a de facto monopoly, then a self-perpetuating oligarchy, denied 86% of its members the right to vote, see the accounts, or even attend general meetings, and of lack of transparency, interest-free loans, etc., with the support of an all-party group of MPs and public figures, including Spike Milligan, who wrote to the Daily Mail about their unsuccessful libel suit against me as follows. Law Society gives you free legal advice. National Health gives you free medicine. Performing Rights Society gives you free libel suits to sue members who ask awkward questions. I'm going to send them my inside leg measurements so they can measure me up for a free libel suit. <laughs> By way of further light relief, when I campaigned for an independent review of PRS, I sent out a resolution to be countersigned as publisher or composer, which came back with the following words, inscribed below the word composer in a very shaky hand. I began to decompose in 1922. Uh, the case I brought against PRS changed the Companies Act when they refused to hand over the voting list and guarantee companies had to disclose the voting lists of the various groups of members. I now move on to music. I produced over 200 recordings of my music many of which have been publicly performed or broadcast around the world. And in 1987, I signed one of the first record deals with China Records after being asked when I produced a bulky copyright agreement, what is copyright? <laughs> and I was later told, we don't have any foreign currency, can you believe? Sadly, the Chinese copyright law, when enacted, discriminated against ageing composers like me by being retrospective. My collaboration with lyricist the late Dick Vosberg resulted in my becoming the only English lawyer, I believe, apart from A.P. Herbert, to receive a Grammy nomination for a Broadway musical, A Day in Hollywood, A Night in the Ukraine, with our song, I Love a Film Cliché. As you'll shortly hear... Dick was a brilliant mimic and regarded as the funniest American on either side of the pond. For example, when I asked him, how did you find your lovely wife? He replied, under a black sailor. <laughs> I hope you'll all, especially movie buffs, enjoy this first public release of Dick's unique original demo recording, doing all the voices in one take, which I personally prefer to the cast album version, I love a film cliché. I love the film cliché, a corny film cliché of a whole generation ago. A nice familiar phrase, like, hey, why don't we put on a show? My kind of dialogue is, please don't shoot my dog, Lassie couldn't have eaten those sheep. And Doris Day's great line, I couldn't bill, I'd only feel cheap. I love the faithless wife who takes her husband's life, but she's glad, 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 glad. 
and Colonel Fotheringay, who starts to shout one day that those drums are driving him mad, mad, mad. I love a line like, gee, why can't I make you see? I got music inside of me, pa. Or when the witness says, the killer's name, Inspector, is Ah! Okay, Tex, you keep him busy. I'm going to work around behind him. Oh, please. Blackmail is such an ugly word. Daddy, why is Mummy crying? Why, why, Miss Murray, without your glasses, you're, you're beautiful. You, you are just like all the others. They too think I'm mad. But my dear, there's no reason to be frightened. Can't you see I'm offering you eternal life? Gay Lower, Wawa has been declared. Paula. Oh, but you can't be that same freckle-faced little tomboy with the braces on her teeth. Yes, my boy, she'll pull through, but she's gonna be a mighty sick little lady for a while. Nice little place you got here, Blue Eyes. Be too bad if something was to happen to it. And there's the western cuss who says, No trial for us! We're for stringing him up right away. There isn't anything as groovy as a movie cliché. Uh, don't play it again, Sam. <laughs> that famous line that was cut out in the short clip. It had to be two, two minutes. Uh, sorry about that, but there we are. It was the best line. <laughs> <laughs> on opening night, we celebrated a hit on Broadway at Sardis with Grammy and Tony nominations. And on the principle, where there's a hit, there's a writ, a lawsuit from the Marx Brothers' heirs, seeking to injunct the show, claiming infringement of their rights in, uh, to the likeness of Groucho Chico and Harpo Marx. The work, material's original. To this, Dick, Rip, Dick Vosberg replied, in 10 years' time, they'll say, it was a wonderful short lawsuit. What was the show? And sure enough, the lawsuit outran the show that ran for two and a half years on Broadway. Council won the case, pleading the Freedom of Speech Amendment defence after claiming it would be the end of vaudeville as impersonators like Sammy Davis Jr. or today Rory, Rory Bremner would have to pay royalties in the USA to originators and he even went so far as to tell the court the heirs of Abraham Lincoln could sue on every penny in circulation with his head on it and every deposit at the Lincoln Savings Bank. Now back to another more challenging battle to combat loneliness. Hell is other people, said John Paul Sartre, and for far too many elderly people here in the UK, hell is the lack of other people. We've just enjoyed a convivial lunch and now we're all here together to discuss important things. In fact, most of us spend so much time in meetings and w working with and take, talking to people that we treasure the time we get to spend alone, reading, thinking and recharging. But just imagine if that time spent alone lasted weeks or months with nobody to talk to and no chance of doing something about it. Not such an attractive proposition. But sadly, this has been the re reality for far too many of our elders for far too long. And that's why I set up Contact the Elderly 50 years ago. That is why I supported Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt's condemnation of the neglect of 800,000 older people of this country as a source of national shame on 18th October and called for support for our cause. Well, I'm joined now by Trevor Littleton, who is the chairman of the charity Contact the Elderly. The charity aims to tackle loneliness and isolation. Um, Trevor, is the Health Secretary right to make this call, or is he just passing on guilt to the rest of us when really the government should be doing more? I believe it's absolutely right. We, have, in Contact the Elderly, are the only national organisation that have focused on isolation since our inception in 1965. And what elderly people want is not the, just the Meals on Wheels, but the chat that goes with it. And this is an essential part of what we do. 
And J Jeremy Hunt, we just heard him there say that there, there is a missing million, and in each and every elderly person has someone uh, who is able to go and talk to them. Is, is that actually correct? It is correct that there's a huge number of people who are off the radar of family and social care support in this country. And we are trying to target as many people as we can via volunteers and our monthly Tea Party outings, which are vital, play a vital role in, in, in focusing on. So, so what you're saying is that there are tens of thousands of families who are effectively ignoring their elderly relatives. Why does it come to that? How does that happen? It's, uh, it may be an Anglo-Saxon thing. I think in certain countries this is not a problem, but certainly we should galvanise society to support them. Mother Teresa said that being alone and unwanted is the world's greatest disease, and she was at the sharp end of human suffering. And I think it's very encouraging that the minister has recognised that it's not just a question of throwing money although we need money to improve social care and, and the length of visits, but it's also the importance of, of having somebody to talk to and feel wanted and be part of the companionship, which is what Contact the Elderly does. But you can't, you can't change a culture in a country or a country's culture by just a speech every now and then, can you? Well, we've been trying to change a culture for 48 years, and we have, we have 7,000 wonderful volunteers throughout the country who only have to give one Sunday afternoon a month, in, which is uh, creating a companionship link, which creates a grandparent, grandchild relationship. So many things happen in between, knitting, but all we, what we do is to ensure that that link takes place. And we want people out there to join us and help provide this companion. It's great fun. They get a lot out of it. The volunteers get an immense amount out of it. And it, it is a benefit to the country, and, and, and the more people who are doing it, the better. Okay, Trevor, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Where we come from, where we hope to go, and how you can help. The following influences prompted me as a 29-year-old solicitor to start Contact the Elderly in 1965. The childhood memory of an old lady's face at a window looking down day in, day out, seemingly with nothing to do and no one to talk to, an image that haunts me still and inspired our first great campaign. The contrasting uh, image of my remarkable grandmother, a highly entertaining raconteur with a rapier wit from whom I learnt as a child that the elderly were much more fun to be with than most of us ever realise. The recollection of the frail old lady I met in a shop in my early twenties who lived alone in the very heart of London without friends, family or electricity or anything to look forward to. These memories combined to inspire me at 29 to encourage young volunteers to help lonely older people and that remains our mission statement to this day. How we started. I persuaded a group of friends to join me in Marylebone by bringing fun into the lives of lonely old people. There was nothing high and mighty about it. We just wanted to get away from the holier-than-thou duty to society approach to voluntary work and have fun making new friends, young and old, along the way. I was shocked to learn from the Marylebone Welfare Association of the thousands of older people living in isolation. And contact might never have taken off at all, but for a wonderful, inspiring social worker. She took immense care in selecting 12 old, uh, lonely pensioners who would benefit from our friendship link and provided detailed lists of individual characteristics, disabilities and special needs. Most important, she gave me the invaluable advice that once we started taking them out of lonely homes, we must never let our old people down. This remains our mantra to this day. As we set off on that first outing in April 1965, 12 volunteers and 12 older passengers, we didn't quite know what to expect, but our spirits soared at our inspirational first tea party on seeing our elder guests smiling, exchanging appreciative glances and addresses. 
We knew we were on to something and making a real difference, enhancing the lives of those for whom our first tea party was the only cross on an empty calendar. We learnt a lot from our guests, especially from Lillian, a courageous Irish lady with both legs in irons, who had been immobilised in her home for months on end. Lillian taught us the power of regular face-to-face -face contact in overcoming disabilities, amazing us after one or two outings by managing to climb a flight of stairs to a tea party and a few months later flying to Lord in search of a miracle. When on her return, we asked her if she'd found the miracle, she proudly announced, my miracle was to be able to get on and off the plane. At that first tea party, we knew from the fantastic rapport between young and old, we would never let our old people down and that we would continue, in Mark Twain's words, to cheer ourselves up by trying to cheer up somebody else, creating happiness, having fun, and enriching lonely lives and our own at the same time. Here is a short clip of Sing Sing a Happy Song I wrote at the time to capture the essence of Contact the Elderly and raise our spirits long before Francis Yip's Chinese version hit the Hong Kong charts. And it is to wake you up. Sing, sing a happy song, a happy song of love. Sing as we swing along to the world we're dreaming of. Where the poor are rich in the things that count and the old are young at heart. Let's sing, sing a happy song and make a brand new start. Ah, 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 ah. To ensure regular commitment, we've stuck to a monthly renewal a face-to-face -face friendship, so volunteers know what's expected and the limited time commitment only one Sunday afternoon a month for drivers, once or twice a year for volunteer tea party hosts. We expanded first across London, growing in the first four years from one to 44 groups with support from Westminster who funded our office in the early days. Our successful initial slogan have fun helping the old in the classified columns of the Times and the Telegraph triggered our huge expansion. However, it became a bit too exciting when we started receiving strange telephone calls at head office after a centrefold spread in About Town magazine displayed in lurid details the activities of a wife-swapping contact organisation. <laughs> we soon realised our successful slogan, have fun helping the old, might be misconstrued. <laughs> and we lost no time in changing our name from contact to the less catchy but safer contact the elderly. <laughs> Loneliness may be on the agenda, high on the agenda now, but we focused on elderly isolation from the start. See my campaign to get social services to tackle the issue as long ago as 1974. I'm now going to give you a rapid trans transit time capsule a la uh, Richard Branson, <laughs> a glimpse of our, some, some of our milestones over the last 50 years. We set up in Scotland in 1973 They've done fantastic things since and taught us a thing or two about how to recruit volunteers quickly. Royal endorsement of 10th anniversary, where Jimmy Savile embarrassed us when I introduced him to the Duchess and he said, if thoughts could speak Duchess, they'd lock me in the tower. I, it was my most embarrassing moment, I can assure you. Royal endorsement of the 21st anniversary, Silver Jubilee at Chatsworth in 1991, hosted by our wonderfully supported president, the late Duke of Devonshire. 35th anniversary report featuring Glenda Jackson, the Duke of Devonshire, and our sponsored London Contact the Elderly Taxi. 
The Duke, in 2000, endorsed the charity, confirming his granddaughter, Lady Jasmine Cavendish, would take over on his retirement. She remains our very much loved president. Royal Diamond Jubilee Tea Party for the elderly at number 10. Boris Johnson attends a contact tea party with another very special guest, who is also our guest today, Barbara Windsor. We celebrated our Golden Jubilee on 19th April 2015, with 360 Contact the Elderly simultaneous tea parties around the country. And uh, our staff here today have greeting cards, which uh, have these wonderful greeting cards, which brilliantly evoke our happiness links, thanks to cartoonist Kipper Williams. And in case you can't work out the figures, these are available for you to pass on to your mathematical friends and spread the word to potential supporters of our cause. Well, as I said before, Mother Teresa said it all. In trying to combat this problem over the 50 years, thanks to dedicated staff and volunteers, our monthly Sunday afternoon tea parties have made a great difference between misery and happiness for isolated people across the country. We, we are the only national charity for older people solely dedicated since inception to tackling loneliness and have made a million face-to-face -face individual happiness links since we started. On hearing about this, happiness guru, Professor Lord Richard Layard author of the landmark book Happiness, wrote that he was fascinated and acknowledged the value of our work. His researches into happiness, by the way, led to the creation of the government's happiness index to measure national progress by happiness as well as GDP. So we therefore take pride in the contrib contribution our million happiness links have made to national progress over the last 50 years. Our research, show, government please note, our research shows our regular friendship links with this elderly save taxpayers funds by a 25% reduction in elderly guest calls on GPs and NHS. Our volunteers stay longer. We have a tried and tested model and are effective because we operate on a Sunday acknowledged to be the loneliest day of the year for older people living alone, when most community services for them aren't available. Our surveys show our outings significantly reduce loneliness. 96% of guests say the tea parties give them something to look forward to. We're often told, at last, I have something to live for. Our survey findings show how our activities make our guests happier, more social, more active and confident. And there are three case studies that prove the same, this, uh, the, the effect of loneliness on these people in, in producing health benefits. You'll see those in your pack. As I assume you will prefer your children and grandchildren to visit you regularly rather than telephone occasionally, please bear in mind how much more lonely older people how much more lonely elder people need hugs and face-to-face -face friendship than telephone befriending. And that in no way diminishes the huge great value of telephone befriending where regular face-to-face -face contacts are unavailable. We work very closely with Esther and Silverline who's doing a fantastic job. We have received, as you will see, awards, John Lewis Charity of the Year, Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award, Financial Conduct Authority, and closer to home, Irwin Mitchell Charity of the Year. And I, if I, I don't know if anyone from Irwin Mitchell is here, but I, I would like to thank them for hosting a, a heartwarming tea party my wife and I attended um, from a long list of 360 simultaneous tea parties nationwide on our Golden Jubilee Day, April the 19th. 
Before I start our golden jubilee, share our golden jubilee cake and plans, a brief film showcasing our work. <laughs> I'm a volunteer driver with Contact the Elderly and that means that basically once a month we go and collect an elderly person and take them to a host family's house and we have a tea party. I think for a lot of people it's just a lifeline that they don't see many people if they haven't got much family. We have a really good laugh at the tea parties and a lot of the stories you hear are just, it's just fascinating to hear about where they've come from, what they've been through. It was so lonely before. I just lost myself. You don't realise what life means to you when you get older. It's very precious. And you've got to really thank God that there's people around you that are there for you. As you start to develop relationships with people, age becomes much less important and you just see the person. This has brought me back to life. Fifty years on, we face huge challenges with, proje with uh, projections of increased longevity and loneliness, the impact of loneliness on health and cost implications. In facing these challenges, and with more than a million off the radar, despite our achievements, we don't rest on our laurels as we celebrate our Golden Jubilee. And that's why our keynote message today is time to care and carry on caring. If not now, when? That's why our Power of Contact campaign has set the following ambitious targets. <clears throat> As you will see from the graph, we are aimed to double our service delivery within five years. To help, this, help achieve this, in June 2014, we declared a state of emergency on loneliness, announcing that the problem of neglected older people had reached breaking point. We campaigned in Parliament, and as members of Solicitors of the Elder will know, in 2014, a year after the Health Secretary described the neglect of 800,000, now a million, elderly as a source of national shame, our calls for financial backing from the government were endorsed by 91 MPs across party in an early day motion, uh, which provides, by the way, an excellent summary of our needs. And I wish to thank and take an opportunity now to thank members of Solicitors for the Elderly who were kind enough to secure signatures from their MPs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very important announcement to make. And I just, this comes hot from the press, as it were. I'm proud and delighted to report that the Prime Minister also supports our campaign and that following my response to his post-election announcement of his One Nation project, I asked him to give priority to the neglected million as a key part of his social inclusion target. As you will see, the Prime Minister 
endorses our major role in shaping society and supports our campaign. Now, please, to ensure these words are matched with deeds, because we all know how busy people are in the, the centre of affairs, please write to your MP contacts or to the Prime Minister urging early government support for our service. As the hero of my youth, Dr Albert Schweitzer had four doctorates in music, theology, philosophy and medicine, while most of us only have a law degree. We should therefore take note of his compelling advice. Start early to instill in your students awareness that they are on this earth to help and serve others. That is as important to pass on to them as knowledge. Our original mission to encourage the young to help the old was set in this spirit, as is our second jubilee target. To set up contact in universities and colleges throughout the country, to encourage students and staff to become the heroes of today and ambassadors of tomorrow in tackling loneliness in old age. To date, we have launched contact groups in Liverpool Hope, Durham, in the last three years, in Durham, Loughborough and Royal Holloway universities and further universities and colleges are in the pipeline. We will greatly welcome your ideas and leads to contact with students and staff at universities, law or other colleges who may wish to help us promote contact initiatives at such institutions. Medical support. We're working towards partnership with the Royal Free and other hospitals. We're encouraging medical practices nationwide to follow the brilliant initiative of Dr. Vela Yudham, an inspirational GP in Liverpool who has started tea parties in his Storesdale GP practice. Please leave one of our leaflets in your GP's surgery next time you go, but if you're lucky enough not to have to visit the GP, leave it on your waiting room table. Uh, we have an important ongoing partnership with the fire brigade and the emergency services, but following a fire at my daughter's house, which was burnt down last year, I unfortunately won't be able to shake the hand of the fire chief as I intended, saying we're going to set the world on fire. Um, and last but not least, of course, our greatly valued partnership with Solicitors for the Elderly, the part you've all been waiting for. What can you do to help? No, you don't have to be a skydiver, but lawyers advising the elderly can play a major role in advocating the need for better social care bearing in mind that spending a little more time without the meter running for a little chat can be even more important to isolated elderly than your advice. If you don't believe it, ask Meals on Wheels visitors. They'll tell you that people prefer the chat to the food. And when you visit clients without family support at home or in care homes, it's not enough to focus solely on legal issues and financial abuse without watching out for social care neglect, which may have a greater impact on the client's life than the legal matter you've come to discuss. Just as a National Gallery trustee with a duty to protect our national heritage wouldn't wish to insure every single item in the collection, uh, unless he wanted to bankrupt the National Gallery, if not the nation, health and safety issues need to be handled with practical common sense. Watch out, therefore, for the all too prevalent tendency to use health and safety requirements as an excuse for inaction. For example, the elderly lady living in sheltered accommodation who complained to me and my wife that she'd been sitting in the same armchair and never put to bed for three months by her carer because of the health and safety. I could have lifted her with one arm and I'm no Olympian. Another carer rejected the suggestion that she should, at the very least, make some attempt to catch a patient before she fell in the bathroom, the excuse, with the excuse that there was no room for a hoist in there. And I've noted all too often when visiting care homes on hot summer days, 
elderly patients remaining cooped up indoors instead of enjoying our rare British sunshine. Health and safety is again trotted out as the excuse for failing to transfer patients to the garden via wheelchairs, which is apparently too much of a challenge for far too many care home staff. I strongly recommend an occasional visit to a client in a care home without giving advance notice to elicit pertinent evidence of poor conditions, lack of quality care or other signs of neglect that are likely to be removed if your visit is expected. And quarter protection. Try and visit your quarter protection clients personally rather than delegating, not always but often if you can, rather than delegate these important links with frail and vulnerable elderly to the most junior staff member. How you can help us. Contact your local areas, contact the elderly regional development officer if you find an isolated person who you think will benefit from our regular tea parties. You've got the details of the website. Legacies. If your elderly clients wish to benefit their less fortunate contemporary, as they very often do, please bear us in mind as a cost-effective charity where every pound donated is multiplied several times by the free face-to-face -face contribution of our 7,600 volunteers nationwide. A legacy or gift will go further to help us achieve our aims and find more volunteers. Or you can volunteer yourself with your family or, fr or colleagues. And as I've said, this takes very little time. Make a diary note to attend our Golden Jubilee St Paul's Cathedral concert and or dinner on 29th October. Uh, perhaps you'd like to book a table for your firm or just attend the concert. If you wish to learn more about supporting our Golden Jubilee campaign, please speak to our staff who you'll find here today and at the tea break. And, um, and if, you're, if you would like, your colleagues to attend without commitment a monthly tea party group in your area to find out what it's all about please ask with a view to having fun driving away loneliness once a month hosting a yearly tea party providing funding or legacy support to reduce loneliness one of the greatest challenges facing our broken society finally remember the lonely little old lady looking down from the window waiting for someone to take notice and care with the unspoken cry, if not now, when? And join us and Barbara Windsor in creating happiness. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just going to say, I just wanted to say, I'm really honoured and delighted to welcome Barbara. You, you spread more joy oh. and, and happiness than anyone I know. You've attended our Golden Jubilee launch and our tea party with Boris, and it's wonderful to have you with us. And sing, sing like a happy song, a happy song of love. Sing as we swing along to the world I dream. All together now, we are rich in the things that count, and the old song of young and hard. Oh, let's sing, sing a happy song and make up when you start. All together now, yes, yes, yes. Here we go, glad. Oh, those were the days, were I remember that. I remember. And it was in China that was a hit, wasn't it? In yeah. China. Can you believe that? What do we say to this, though? Thank you so much. What, what do you say? He said, he said to me, we all say, he said, are you going to say something afterwards? No. I mean, these people, what you've... You know, they've got to take that all in, darling. It's got to stay in. And that was fantastic. And you couldn't have put it more, more better. Uh, I worked for Boris. Oh, God, that is something I tell you. And, uh, and, it, and he said, well, you're getting old. He came and did a, a little uh, scene with me in EastEnders. I don't know if any of you saw it. It was a whole scene where he was... Uh, I was going up for council. You know, I decided I was going to put the world to rights as Peggy Mitchell. And uh, he, um, he, was, he was cycling around. I was going around saying, this is a disgrace. Look at this. I'm going to get onto that Boris. If ever. Anyway, he was cycling around on his bicycle. Got a puncher. And, of course, next thing, he's in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> 
And whereas I'd said, if I ever see him, am I going to give him Saurus? No. I said, oh, hello. <laughs> hello, how lovely to see you and all the rest of it. I put on my mum's voice, you know. Went, Don't tell anyone we come from the East End. It was like that. Anyway, so uh, we became mates. And he, he said to me, you know, can you, is there anything you can do? So I, I said, well, whatever you want, think I'm, I can do, you know. And he couldn't believe how old I was. Going, oh, I look young. I know, that's just, it, it's the family, it's in the genes. It's not, you know. So he said, well, what about this? And I said, yeah, fine. And that's where I met you. And it's wonderful. All what you've said and you've portrayed is, is just how it is. They really need... I tell you what, and then I did his, his um, bringing communities together. Because let's face it, love, there's all sorts of living here. And we've all got to learn to live together. You see, whereas once upon a time I was a little girl, it was the same, same people, you know. All those, but now it's a bit of everything. I love it. I think it's fantastic. And... Um, so he said, I want you to have street parties. So we started doing street parties. And one of the things was, wasn't there necessarily bringing all the different people from all over the world who come to live here? Not bringing them together so much. There was aggro. Yes, of course, there's always going to be aggro. But it was the old people who wouldn't come out their houses. I, I couldn't believe that, who'd lost their family, and they were left alone. And I used to go and knock and say, come on, come out, and have a little chit-chat and a little dance and all this. That's what got... So that's why I was so... For you, for all this, you know, you'd be amazed how elderly are left. You wouldn't think that, would you? And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here, would we? Anyway, it's uh, lovely to meet you all. You've all been fantastic. We'll all have a little rabbit later, won't we? But uh, lovely. Thank you so much, and uh, we've listened to you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I couldn't say more than that. Thank you so much. Thank you.